Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our May workshop from Array Global uh, Educational Services. We're really excited to be with you again. And uh, we're, we're doing this last uh, uh, visit of the year for uh, our schools. We will resume again in August. And we know that you will all be very busy in the summer and uh, we're happy to be with you. I'm Dr. Ray Lindley and with me today is Dr. Jacob Frankham, Mr. Danny Eichelberger, and we'll be doing uh, this uh, workshop in three areas. The first thing we're going to be doing is discussing some ideas for how you can support learning activities through the summer, not only for you, but for your students and give them some inspiration on things to do. The second part of the uh, workshop today uh, we have tried to summarize, we received many questions as we requested from you, and we obviously can't speak specifically to every one, but we've tried to summarize into three main categories the questions that came uh, as a result of last month's workshop. And then the third part of the workshop today will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. Uh, we know that we might say something that will cause a question to come to your mind, or something like that. And so we will devote the third part of the workshop to you. So we'll, beginning, uh, we'll begin today with uh, how, how can we uh, support learning through the summer, not only for you, but for your students. And because uh, those will both be important. And I think uh, we're just going to go through these. Uh, we have an overhead or a PowerPoint that will present these. And uh, the three of us will kind of jump in and uh, go from there. So Dr. Jake, I think you're starting. Yeah, welcome everyone. I'm glad everyone could join us today. We have some great topics uh, about supporting learning, not just for the summertime, but to get started and rejuvenated for next year. Um, and we'll jump right in to this. And the, we're going to talk about 14 strategies to support that learning. And then we're going to talk specifically about what you can do as an educator to make sure that you are ready to start next year, because you're the key to success in the classroom and your school. The first one is, is to get outdoors. These are strategies for students to help them be successful as they uh, go through the summertime and get ready to start school this coming fall. They need to get outdoors. They need to be physically active. They need to be getting some vitamin D through being in the, in the sun. They need to be active. They need to uh, be engaged. And, and that is so important for them to be doing that um, as they've been uh, maybe inside a lot more during the school year. But being outside is so key um, to being rejuvenated and to come back with the energy that they need to be successful and have their minds in place to uh, start learning again and to focus and be redirected towards um, education. So get outdoors. Uh, and I think that that's a good piece of advice, not just for students, uh, but for staff members too. I know I spend outdoors a lot more in the summertime um, than I do at, at other times of the year. So uh, for you and for your students, get outdoors, enjoy, enjoy the nature around us. The second idea that we're going to suggest to you is for you and for your students to develop a bucket list. Now, if the bucket list is a new term to you, it's a list of things that I want to do this summer. And we encourage you, if you still have students, uh, if they're still in school, encourage them to create a bucket list of things that will uh, they, they want to do. And you can work on this as an assignment in your classrooms. And you also can develop your own bucket list. And one suggestion on this bucket list if possible, if for instance, you're teaching third graders, bring the fourth grade teacher in to your classroom and have the fourth grade teacher say, I'm really looking forward to having you in my class next year. Here are some things that you could do this summer to prepare for next year. That's a bucket list. And, and that's really something that uh, uh, will help you and the students uh, emphasize the importance. The third, uh, the third area is to set goals. Uh, if, if you don't have a goal, uh, if you get there, you'll never know. So what are the goals that you have for this summer? What are the goals that the students have for this summer? And they don't necessarily have to be academic. 
we're going to be talking about some other things that they can do this summer. But setting goals is really a, a, an important thing to know. Here's what I plan to do. And as we go through these things, you'll see some other things that will help them knowing how to set goals. Uh, the next is uh, following a daily schedule. Make sure as you work with your students and talk to their parents that they know what they're going to be doing every day, that it's not sleeping in till one or two o'clock in the afternoon, that they are getting up in the morning time, early in the morning, that they're being engaged, that they're having good, healthy meals, and that they're utilizing that time again to rejuvenate, but also to spend some time to exercise their minds. They're not just going to be exercising their bodies, but they need to be exercising their minds. Maybe not as much as they would during uh, class time, school time, but they should be involved in some daily schedules. And we're going to talk about some different things that they could be involved in, in this daily schedule. And I think, Danny, you were going to speak to that too. Yeah. And I do. One thing I wanted to also reiterate is that following a daily schedule, it can be about the enjoyment of summer and the activities that will lend them to having a, a great time and, and so that they can rejuvenate before the new school year. But most importantly, it keeps them in the pattern and we all need it. We all know the research shows us that we need structure, we need patterns and that we need daily routines that help keep us uh, positive and, uh, and um, fluidly moving through the day so that we can be prepared for the next year. And, it, and that will cut down on some of that uh, stressor for students when they enter the new school year, that they've got, they've set good, healthy patterns, uh, even though it may be just getting up and exercising, getting up and, uh, and writing, you know, maybe they're gonna go on a trip with their family, but following those patterns and not getting so far out of, uh, out of sorts that they don't have those good, healthy habits when they return to school. I want to go back to getting outside. This is very similar. This is very related. Limiting screen time. Um, this is where students and, and even us adults sometimes like to be on the screen too much. And we need to limit that time that we are on the screen because that we, we know from Hattie's research, uh, one of the biggest things that, that hinders uh, educational advancement and learning is the summertime. And then the second time is limiting the screen time. So we need to make sure that we are utilizing our summertime and we're not spending it all on the screen, playing video games, scrolling through social media, uh, watching YouTube. Um, some of those things might be good to do a little bit, but we need to limit that. We need to make sure that we're controlling how much is being uh, consumed in the in the screen. And we need to make sure that our students are utilizing that time effectively. That's why we're talking about a daily schedule. That's why we're going to be talking about reading. That's why um, we need we need students to be engaged with goals. So limit limit your screen time, limit student screen time. And it would not be a bad idea to send this information to the parents of the students because if, if you can emphasize to the parents the importance of limiting the screen time, you know, because of COVID and all the school shutdowns and so forth, they spend a lot of time on the screen and they need to learn that or they need to practice the fact that the screen time, and that's one of the biggest learning deficits that we've seen, is students are not really paying attention to uh, those uh, uh, lessons and so forth, but they're just limiting, they're not limiting their screen time. So helping them to understand that would be really great. Now, the sixth thing that we're suggesting is what something we call weather sticks. Okay, we know that during the summer, especially, there might be different uh, weather, it might be raining, it might be extremely hot, it might be sweltering. Uh, if, if you lived in Colorado where I do, right now I'm looking outside and we had about six inches of snow last night. In the middle of early in this week, we had temperatures in the high 80s Fahrenheit and we're supposed to have them high 80s uh, this weekend. But here we have snow for the last 24 hours. You might well, want to explain what snow is for some of them, Dr. Gray. <laughs> some of them might not know what snow yeah. is or have seen it very much. I know. Yeah. Well, I, I will say for those of you in, Thai, in uh, Saudi Arabia, go up to Taif or to Abha and once in a while you'll see it. But anyway, weather sticks, maybe take these popsicle sticks and help 
them help their parents understand when it's raining here here's an idea of something i can do pick up a popsicle stick and have written on there some ideas or when there's it's so hot to even be outside here's some ideas that we can do but anyway the weather sticks we thought was was kind of a fun way to help them understand uh that not all the weather is going to be the same but anyway it's the weather sticks well, and, and what I like about this, Dr. Ray, is as many of us as parents, we've had to deal with this with, with children where they're saying, I just, I'm just so bored. I don't know what to do. This is easy. Go grab a weather stick and it says, bake a cake, um, you know, go do this, go do that and, and stay engaged. Go on a, uh, go visit your neighbor, go visit your grandparent or something like that. There's a lot of things that could be done and it makes it exciting too. Great. Danny. I think you're muted, Danny. There you go. I like that as well. Um, thinking about that is, is we keep, keep these ideas um, active and enjoyable, but we just add a little bit of structure by having them kind of preset with their family and talk about activities they can do throughout the summer. So if they do have to pull a weather stick, there will be a level, like you said, of excitement and uh, they'll anticipate wanting to do that. And it'll give them that structure they need to kind of hone their energy in. And so with the reading list, uh, Danny, I did post um, the Padlet that you shared with, with me earlier. If you want to talk a little bit about that, um, those reading skills and some of the suggestions that they have for teachers and for parents. Yeah, so, so much of, you know, we talked a lot, even just in our trainings this year, about preparing students to be um, quality, uh, I'd say it, test takers and to prepare them to understand prompts and things that they'll experience on a test. But so much we lose is that enjoyment reading. And I think we, we need to spend so much of our time encouraging our students, especially in the summer months, to do enjoyment reading, reading that is um, that just completely is exciting to them, gives them the opportunity to dig deep, because that actually creates just as well as preparing them with uh, writers' frameworks and frameworks to, to be good response writers. Those are just nice strategies and tricks, but what we really, obviously, what students really flourish in is the opportunity to read content that they absolutely enjoy. And it, I think it makes them stronger readers. And one of the things that we're gonna share with you is a colleague of mine here uh, in Las Vegas, she uh, worked with me and some of my university students at the uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And she created a Padlet, and that Padlet is an open source. There shouldn't be any, any um, inability to get in and access that content. And there are resources for teachers. There are resources for students and things that would be very supportive for parents. Feel free to, to browse that Padlet and look at some of the content. Uh, some of it is just absolutely excellent content if you're a newer teacher. It's uh, the newest research on how to... How to um, gauge instruction for readers uh, in English language arts as well. And then also it's uh, content where students can have access to high quality uh, books. And so I would encourage you as it is a free resource and it's all packaged in one place by very quality um, professors and teachers that you would use that and access that Padlet. And again, we'll make that available to everyone. And please, we encourage you to um, use that and share that with your students as appropriate as they're exiting for summer. Yeah, and that really? Padlet, we just put it in the chat. Um, so make sure you access that. It's also for those that are on our, our Facebook page. But with the reading list too, some things just to make it a little bit structured is create a chart for your students so you can track it. So when they come back in the fall, you know exactly how much they've read and, and it also helps them be encouraged to know exactly what they're gonna read. If you give them a reading list, um, also, encourage them to read 30 minutes a day. That's not that much for them to stay engaged, and that will help in dealing with that learning loss that happens over the summertime, like I mentioned that Dr. Hattie um, uh, has conducted some research on. And then provide some awards. Encourage parents to provide some awards, or you can provide some awards when school starts again. A great way to follow up with them to make sure that they've been engaged throughout the summertime. And, you know, I, I, I have a term that I like. It's called vacation reading. And on vacation reading, it's truly just enjoyable reading. 
And sometimes students need to learn, they, as Danny said, sometimes they need to learn that they can just read something fun. It doesn't always have to be preparing for the next assignment. But another idea is if they know that the teacher they're going to have next year, or if it's going to be you, that there will be some award or rewards to keep this list and say, you know, we're going to uh, give you some extra credit for keeping this journal and this reading, reading awards and so forth. That's great. Which leads us to the next one, which is keeping a journal. And uh, there's probably no one activity that in the long run will help your students uh, grow more is to keep journals. And the journals are can be very simple. It's not like a dear diary, uh, uh, you know, I feel bad or whatever, but a journal. What did I do today? What do I want to do tomorrow? What are some goals that I have? But keeping a daily journal about what they, uh, about what they uh, have done and want to do. So journaling can be very important. And the nice thing about it is when school starts, you can use that as part of their writing assignment because then you'll have an opportunity to do some, some checking on their writing and the, because of the journals that they've written. And I think the biggest thing that we're emphasizing is just to combat that learning loss again, more reading, more writing, uh, that's gonna help them be so much more successful as they start the next grade level. And Dr. Ray, I always called it, instead of uh, vacation reading, I always called it brain candy. Brain candy. Brain candy, yeah, because it, yeah, it just, it's fun to read, it, it keeps people engaged. And so help students find books that, that they are interested in um, and, and that they are passionate about and they get glued to. I, yeah. That's how I got started in reading because mm -hmm. I started reading books that I really enjoyed. And then I I'll, branched I'll, out and read uh, other books. Uh, I'll, I'll make an admission, which I shouldn't make, but I will anyway. My vacation reading lately has been reading all of the great novels that I read in my undergraduate work in college that I had to read because I had to read it for the class over the course, but I didn't really read them. I just read it, but now I'm reading them to enjoy them. So we can help students learn how to enjoy reading. Another thing we could do and encourage parents to do is teach students life skills. Some parents think that the school should be teaching all of the life skills but what a great opportunity for parents to build relationships more strongly, more strong with their children by doing life skills together. Like the picture shows, maybe cook, doing some cooking activities. That's always a fun thing because which kid doesn't really, which kid doesn't like to eat? They all like to eat. Show them how to bake cookies, how to make cake, um, how to make dinner, maybe make an assignment. I know growing up in my home, I had to make dinner um, every Thursday night. We had, I had a, a lot of siblings, but my job was to make it every Thursday night. And that really instilled in me some life skills that helped me out um, throughout the rest of my life when I moved out of home. But show students how to cook, how to clean, um, how to do simple maintenance around the house, maybe even uh, getting out and cleaning the car, maybe doing some maintenance in a car, doing some yard work. Uh, uh, summertime in many parts of the world, uh, especially where we live, this is a great time to go out and get some yard work. You're doing a lot of things. You're being outdoors and you're learning some different life skills. And I'm sure you can come up with a, good, a lot of life skills that you want your students to have um, as they go on to the next grade level. So think about those things, present those to the parents um, and help them schedule and, and structure their summer based upon that. The, yeah, the next one is create a calendar of exercises. And I think Danny talked about this a little bit already, where exercising is so important. And so create a calendar, say, hey, every day we want our second grade class who's moving on to third grade, we want them to go on a walk for 30 minutes. Some of them where it's warm out, they might have to get up pretty early, but they're being, they're getting some exercise, they're moving around which in turn helps them utilize their brain a lot more effectively. It creates endorphins in their body to help them be more happy um, and help them be more engaged in building relationships with their family members and their peers, and just overall, just uh, being much more comfortable in life. And then lastly, join an athletic team. A lot of your uh, students, they like to be active. They like to be moving around. They should join some kind of a team or a club to stay engaged and focus. 
Uh, so, so think about where they can, where they can have that engagement. And so that they're not just on social media all the time, that they're not just engaged with their screen, but they're seeing people face to face on a regular basis. And this, this in turn is helping them to be outside, be physically engaged and, uh, just overall being, being, um, physically prepared to, to enter school next year. No, no, I wanted to also say, um, Jacob, that, you know, joining an athletic team, it creates so many usable lessons in life and also in school, because as you work together with a team, as you build something and, and take the necessary steps to improve your athleticism, your um, cardiovascular, uh, watching yourself improve in a physical setting also lends itself to understanding how to improve, improve in an educational setting. So I think that um, team sports really help uh, whether it's, it could be individual, it could be wrestling, it could be anything, but that ability to push yourself in a physical endurance type of way actually lends itself to how to, the mental capacity to push yourself educationally. Yeah, there's so many life skills that are learned from uh, being part of an athletic program or, or even a club. So uh, yeah, go out, help your students join, join uh, some kind of program. And this is a big one. Uh, encourage students to do activities with their families. A little bit ago, uh, when uh, Dr. Jake was talking about life skills activities, one of the people on the workshop made the comment that cooking is a great way for parents and children to bond, to get together. So what are those life family games and activities that can really help them bond with each other? And it, it is something that will help them in their future growth to understand the importance of family. And Dr. Ray, there's a comment actually on Facebook, Usama said that when we are involved in these games and activities and we're teaching students life skills, it gives them background information background information that helps them best better understand content when we're talking them about them in science activities or in when we're reading books in our classrooms. So these are all, uh, that's a great point that, that uh, he was able to make about giving them the background knowledge because some of our students just don't have that background knowledge to really understand um, different concepts that we discuss in, in class. Great. Another possibility is, uh, to, uh, and this could be used in the beginning of the next school, have them develop a photo album. Some kids are very, very uh, active in, in their cell phones and taking photos and have them develop an a, a photo album, even if it's something they're gonna show to their teachers on their cell phones when the, when the, school, year, uh, when the school year starts, but have them develop a photo album and include in that some specific things. Again, to encourage them to prepare for next year, here are some specific assignments that you could work on. But remember also that we can't make it all about school. It has to be about enjoyment. And uh, so developing a photo album and giving some assignments. Now we wanna uh, kind of move ahead uh, to maybe three specific suggestions for you as teachers to uh, help you this summer and prepare for next year. Uh, the first one is reflect. Uh, this is always a great time. You have a couple weeks or a couple months to really reflect back on how this past year went or the past two years and sit down and look at all the positive things that happened, all the positive things and ways that you're able to grow and develop as an educator. And also maybe start writing down some things that you really want to focus on, that you want to improve on, you want to develop. Because development is a step-by-step -step process. And, it, and sometimes it's a small step here and a small step there and every year we get better and better but if we are not improving as educators we're not being uh, productive for our students there's the old adage uh, for administrators and uh, maybe even teachers that say don't be a first year teacher 20 times where you're you've taught for 20 years but you're doing the exact same thing that you did the very first year your first year should be a stepping stone to move higher to the second year to the third year uh, and it, when you've been teaching for 20 years, you should be 20 times better than you were the first year. You should be better as the years go by. And you need to do that as educators. We all need to do that by reflecting and being crit and, and really looking at ourselves introspectively and being honest with ourselves on how we can improve and develop. So reflection, take this time to reflect. Don't beat yourself up. 
but because you need to really look at the positive things that have gone on and then also focus on some things that you want to improve and maybe just choose two or three things that you want to improve on. Set some goals and move forward. Yeah, Dr. Jake said it. It's really important. Don't beat yourself up. I look back on my very first year of teaching, and I think, oh, my goodness, I really, I shouldn't have done that, or I really blew it, or I did. But don't beat yourself up. Learn from experiences that didn't go well, because uh, we, uh, we learn from our mistakes. And if you're not learning from your mistakes, you're not growing. Danny. Yes, and um, talking about reading, I like this This lines itself up really nicely, Jacob, is that this idea that you have this time to reflect. Most teachers are leaving. This was, again, for us, even in the United States, uh, it was a difficult year. Omicron, it put a lot, uh, we kind of thought we were past some of these COVID issues, and then we had some really tough, we had a tough fall. And then as things let up and the restrictions let up and people moved on, it, we still had attendance issues and some things. So, you know, as I reflect on a year, as we look back on this year, I started to think that teachers were starting to get a little frustrated. They were tired and they were having the impact of students returning to school uh, after a long pandemic. So we, we thought, you know, the two years prior were difficult. And then we walked into a year where it was really about resetting parameters. It was about resetting the tone of your school building that culture back and filling in gaps. And we asked a lot of teachers. So the frustration levels in some cases were high. And so when I thought about a book, one book that helped me a lot was a book called Help for Billy. Um, it was, uh, it's called a Beyond Consequences Approach to Helping Challenging Children in the Classroom. And it's written by Heather Forbes. And what I liked about this book is it takes the personal interaction. Sometimes we, we get into, um, we get into a power struggle with students and we get frustrated and they kind of hit us at the wrong time. Maybe it's the end of the day if we're tired. But if we learn that students that act out in some instances have had trauma and are um, reactive in their approach in the way that the brain sciences, you know, they, they're acting with that kind of reptilian style of their brain and they've learned, they've learned to fight, uh, they've learned to push back and that's worked most of their life. And now they're in a classroom setting where you need decorum and, you know, that classroom has to flow. So that's a book that was really helpful for me as I kind of engage and work back with teachers is how do we take the personal part out of it and just lend ourselves to helping students evolve and grow and giving ourselves the, the grace to like help them and, and help them fix their issues because one thing I've, I've noticed, and I, it, this will go into another portion we're going to talk about in some of your questions from the past, and I'm tying in a couple, couple issues, is we talk, we're going to talk about classroom uh, management. And one thing I will tell you is that students, students have dealt with some of the students that are the most needy, maybe that struggle the most, and they've known them for a few years. They've been in classes with them. So there's nothing novel about the acting out. What they're really interested in is how we as the educators, as the adults, how we're going to handle those most challenging students. So again, a book like Help for Billy is super, super supportive in us modeling to students how we handle those most difficult students. So that's what I love about reading and choosing, choosing a reading. Once you've reflected, go and, go and become the expert in that subject because your excitement level is going to be there. You're going to have the summertime to probably be under less duress and less stress. So you can absorb that information and come back to the next school year with a lot more content knowledge and a lot more expertise. And then you can support your colleagues and you can be, like I said, the expert in that field at that time. Because wherever your passion goes and your research goes, that's what's going to help you in your following year to, be, to maintain. And that's what helps keep your career exciting. You know, whether you work a 20 or 30 year career, it's, you know, always growing and learning. That's where the reading piece comes in. So the reflection and reading pieces is absolutely necessary. And we encourage you to take the summertime to read upon materials. And of course, we want you to read things. And of course, we as all adults want to read, have enjoyment reading and things that we absolutely um, that just help build us back up. But I just really want to encourage you. Once you have that one thought that you go, I really want to improve upon this next year, go and find the best research. And some of that can be found, like I said, in that padlet that we shared, but it takes the time in the summer to 
just do some enjoyment reading, but also some reading that's going to help you fill you back up for next year. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a big deal. But let me, let me finish this part with what I consider one of the biggest deals. And it's a five-letter word. And it's spelled R-E-L-A-X. You need to use this time to relax. Don't, don't deny yourselves of the pleasure of relaxing this summer. Take some time just to enjoy yourself. And I, and I just suggest that you always find the time for the things that make you happy to be alive. You always find the time for the things that make you happy to be alive. So on top of everything else we've said, which could be a long laundry list, but learn to relax. So enjoy that this summer. We'll move on to the next section of the workshop now. And uh, we received uh, many, many, many questions that we requested last year. And we've tried to summarize these into three general areas, which, which we'll speak to. And if we don't uh, address a question that you think is really burning on your mind, please, uh, uh, please feel free, because we'll leave time at the end for you to ask questions. But the first question that we saw more than once was one on time management. How do you manage your time as a teacher? And, and let me make, uh, I'll, I'll start this off and uh, uh, then the uh, other two guys will take the two other questions. Uh, first of all, in time management, in your head, focus on the big picture. What is it we're really trying to do? If you read uh, Array Global's goal, our goal is to help you improve students. And when students improve, schools improve. That is the big picture. Now, all these little details, but understand what the big picture is. Then the second thing I'd suggest on time management is keep lists. Keep lists of the things that you need to do. If you could see my desk in front of my computer right here, I have one, two, five, six, seven, eight different notes to myself. Now, Dr. Jake puts these on his computer. I write little notes to myself and say, here's something I'm going to do tomorrow. Here's something I'm going to do today. And, and, and I make notes to myself because when I sit down at my office in the morning, these notes are right there. So make lists and make them visible so that you can't ignore these. Sometimes we go, oh, we'll forget this. No, just make a list. Find a way to do this. But, but then focus only on one thing at a time. Don't try to do several things at once. Set a time schedule. Focus on one thing at a time. And another suggestion is plan your week in advance. Don't just say, okay, today, what am I going to do? But give a general outline for your week in advance so that you can be ready to say, well, on this day, I know we'll do this. If you have appointments, uh, which most of us do from time to time, you know that you got to block that out. You can't do anything. So, but you know it's coming later, whatever this uh, planning is. And I say, take care of the highest priorities first. There are things that we like to do, and there are things that we must do. So let's make sure that we take care of the highest priorities. And another one that's very hard for teachers, it's hard for all of us, and that's the word delegate. We need to learn to delegate responsibilities for other people. If they think that you as the teacher are the end all of end alls, and that you're going to do everything, it leaves them out. So if you have a family, delegate responsibilities, and especially with your own children, so that they know they have a real, uh, the real part of this family makeup. And the last thing I'll suggest, if you haven't uh, dealt with SMART goals, let me just suggest to you that when you do goals, use the word SMART, S-M-A-R-T, SMART goals. They're specific for the S. They're measurable. They can be measured. They're achievable. You're not probably going to send a rocket ship to the moon tomorrow, but is it achievable? The fourth, is it realistic? And fifth, is there a time limit on it? So smart goals. That will help you organize your time to make sure that you are doing what you need to be doing. So Dr. Jake put them up there, specific, they're measurable, they're achievable, they're realistic, and they're time limited. So hopefully that'll give you some general ideas 
on time management. And a lot of it will depend on how faithful you are to the list that you make. Dr. Jake, I think you have the next question. Yeah, could you remind me what it was? Uh, you're gonna, there were some questions about science labs and some people have some issues with science labs. Oh, and yes. They, they, yeah. It's all virtual. That's they right. don't have a lab itself. Yeah, and, and as teaching science, I taught science for many, many years. Um, as a science teacher, what I enjoyed and how I enjoyed teaching science the most is utilizing things that students saw on a daily basis. So if I couldn't do a lab getting specific stuff from the local store, I didn't do that lab. I would go and find the baking soda, the sodium, which is sodium bicarbonate and uh, the vinegar, uh, acetic acid. And that's what I would be utilizing because that's what students were familiar with. Um, and, and I would tie in some of the cooking too, because there's a lot of chemistry that goes on with that. Uh, so that, that's how I would utilize chemistry with physics. I would also do just things that are around us because that's what gets kids excited about science is, is knowing and understanding the, what, what goes on around them. And so uh, if, if you don't have a science lab, that's fine. That's actually more fun to do science without a lab and just utilizing your, your classroom but I, what I also like to do and suggest to science teachers is get out of the classroom. If you're going to figure out uh, the simple machines for physics, go around and have them uh, walk around their neighborhood and write down or take pictures of the simple machines that they see. And what a great way to get them excited about science. Um, you don't need a science lab to teach science. It's great to have for upper level science, um, but not all the time. I've taken some great college classes and all of the science was done uh, by, by simple things that help us best understand what we are um, involved in and what we see regularly. So science labs, uh, let get creative, do a lot, do some research. There's some great, great information out there. And the third question, which is a summary of, of several of the questions that we're going to address, Danny's going to talk about uh, classroom management and some ideas because there are questions about eh, how do I take care of these students? So, Danny? Yeah, thank you. Uh, one thing that we looked at, and I was kind of looking at some of the research on Edutopia and academic uh, scholarly um, articles that we find online, and it's all backed by research. And what it's finding is that students do very well when they have the greatest connection to their teacher and they know that their teacher cares about them. So it kind of goes back to what I was saying in that book, Help for Billy, is creating connections and working with students, meeting, greeting them at the door every day, um, just trying to connect and understand where they're at. Because you can see the, the temperament of a student very quickly. You can kind of read their, their, their facial language and their body language and if they're ready for a good day. And, if you're meeting with the door, you can sort of cut that off. And if there's, then they feel like you're being proactive. You're not just reacting to them. If they're active in class, they know that you, you care, you're greeting with the door. And that's sign of the sign of a, a high quality school that those things are going on regularly. And, um, you know, that the research shows that by doing this type of engagement, um, that we, the rest of the day boosts academic engagement by 20 percentage points while reducing disruptive behaviors by nine percentage points. So it, the research shows that that has an, a positive impact just starting by greeting them at the door. And a lot of teachers kind of come up with their own handshakes or uh, maybe they do like the fist pound or those kind of things. Uh, the other is um, you know, continue to maintain those relationships. And I know we talk about this, but making sure that we call home when things are going well. Uh, obviously, the more parents get to hear us when we're reaching out for something going positive, that builds on that. That, and I know that's um, really kind of big picture, but that's those things are super important when we're creating a tone for the summer, and you know, and also or for the next year, and also just even sending a letter home for for parents, and it just lets them know again that it gets them from that sense that teachers are just reacting, but that we're more proactive and we're thinking about their child even, you know, even if we create those letters now and send them off during the summer strategically. Uh, the other uh, suggestion is in your classroom, when you are starting to create norms and when you need the classroom to be silent, have a cue that every student knows. It could be a wind chime, it could be a bell, it could be a clap pattern. But students need to know that when you 
are ready for them to, when you're ready to have their audience and maybe they're in a group discussion or they're doing some group learning, we need, always need a strong strategy to pull them back in. And, you know, sometimes middle school and high school teachers tell me, oh, I don't need that. We don't, we don't need it. But I would tell you that all classrooms, especially in elementary, need uh, a common cue that everybody uses. Um, in our school, they do um, five to zero. So if uh, the talking level's at a five, they put a five up. If they want students absolutely silent, they go to a zero. And students, because they all know it, respond to it really well. Uh, the other is seating. You know, there's, there's some debate in education about how students choose their seating, but be very strategic about how we seat students. How are they gonna flourish in their seating patterns and in group work? Um, do we do, you know, do we strategize ability groupings and personalities so that students can flourish within those groups? And, you know, if we don't wanna just like have students walk in and just start choosing without having a strategy because typically they will choose students that might get them, um, off offbeat and off pattern but if they have buy-in and they know your procedures then you can go back you know have can in introduce some more choice uh the other is um be specific in your praise students like us as adults they want to know exactly what they're doing right and they want it tied to those norms and those those things that you've created as a classroom set like oh we have you know here we always assume good intentions we, we, don't, we don't talk when somebody else is talking. Um, if we disagree with someone, we do it civilly, we do it respectfully, and we give students sentence stems to start off those kind of discussions. So that's another one is giving specific praise. When a student does those things that we're looking for in the classroom, we can never slow down enough. We can never appreciate their efforts enough. So just making sure that we praise them and uh, setting clear expectations. Um, some teachers build those with students at the beginning of the year so that every Everybody has buy-in. Sometimes they're created in advance, but letting students know the why behind those. Hey, we do these at this time. It's to create. Um, we want to have a sense of you know urgency that we want to get through material, but we also want to make it to lunch and recess on time. You know, whatever the reasons are, we've got to set those clear expectations and share them with students about the room and actively supervise when we're in a classroom. You know, it's we kind of see it. Teachers at every at this time of year, they start to let off the throttle a little bit, testing's over, there's only a few days of school left, and what happens when teachers let off the throttle and they're not circulating the room is the classroom students feel that, and they start to, their um, noise levels rise up, the movement around the classroom rises up, so it's always, you know, make sure that we inspect what we expect when we're watching and monitoring classroom behaviors, that we really are in the mix and we're talking to students and we're having those educational discussions and we're helping them think through the content. And uh, most importantly, and we know this is consistency, 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 no matter who it is that when we're enforcing these classroom policies that we do it consistently across the board. And when students know that you're consistent, then they, they rise to the occasion. So those are some things that we've been thinking about as we wanted to talk about setting your classroom expectations for next year. Great, and Danny, I, while you were speaking, I couldn't help but think of a, of a statement that we made in a prior workshop. Your students don't care how much you know, but they do know how much you care. So let's remember that. So I, I, I say to you in conclusion of this portion of the workshop, take pride in how far you've come this year. Have faith in how far you can go but don't forget to enjoy the journey. Don't forget to enjoy it. So we're gonna uh, open it up now. If there are some specific questions that you would like to have, uh, please uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll try to address those as best we can. And we'll take just about 10 to 12 minutes to do this. And uh, Farouz, uh, your, looks like your hand is up. Uh, you wanna unmute yourself, please? Yeah, as always, that was an engaging session. Thank you very much. And a kudos to the organizers, specifically to Dr. Jacob and Dr. Ray and uh, Mr. Denny. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. My question is the following. You know, uh, you've been showing some great tips, and one of them really struck me, uh, which was limiting the screen time. You know, uh, the entire world has been through challenging times of pandemic. And perhaps some parts, part, part of the world is still going through that phase of challenge. 
And, you know, the world has been trying to integrate and incorporate blended and hybrid learning uh, quite uh, deeply to the education curricula. And given the, the fact that a lot of self-study is done online and a lot of great teaching resources and learning materials are also available online. So how do we, uh, you know, comprehend the idea of limiting screen time when, you know, we are pushed to, to develop uh, professionally online rather than offline. And even this workshop is uniting us online rather than us being somewhere or like uniting offline. So how would that be possible to limit the screen time, especially in the summertime when we have lots of free time and we'll be probably locked up somewhere in our, in our part of the world and we have no time to move around. So what we can do is, you know, get on the internet and just uh, search and, and, and dive deeper into lots of great, amazing materials. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ray, I can, I can start to address that. I, I think Farouz, I think it's a I think it's a very worthy question. I think it's about balance and it's about the type of technology and type of screen time that you're utilizing. If you're spending hours scrolling through social media or watching useless YouTube videos, um, it, it's just a waste. I mean, there's probably a time and a place for that in a short period of time each day or, or uh, each week, perhaps, but not all the time, not wasting your time. Video games. Um, I, I know there's some positive research on different types of video games, but if a, if a child is playing video games or an adult for that matter is playing video games for 10 hours a day, um, we need to recognize that that, that is not healthy and that's not socially, um, uh, that's not helping them socially either, but there are some good things about technology that we can utilize. We're utilizing it right now. Um, there was also a question in the chat a little bit ago when we were talking about reading, should we should we not allow reading on screens uh, using Kindles or other type of, of technology that helps us read? I, I think we should. I think that helps us to read, but that's not the type of screen time that we're really focusing on. We're focusing on the wasteful um, non-education that, that's, that's going on. Yeah, is, and I, was, I was going to add the same thing. Uh, the idea is not to say no screen time, but let's show them I've often said, you know, the internet is a great tool. However, one of the things we have to teach students is there's good internet and there's bad internet. And so it's screen time. There's good screen time and there's bad screen time. But if we take all of these other ideas of things they can be doing in the summer, let's make sure that they're not all involved around the screen. That's I did. Danny, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, and I think Farouz had mentioned also just the important, like the value of journaling even online. We which is completely valuable. It's, you know, it's, it's pretty much, you know, what we expect of students at end of year when they, when they assess, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty normal at this point to like have a lot of thoughts down on, uh, on digitally. And so again, I think that's, you know, a proper use of that time where I think we, we've just got to make sure that students have a lot of rich hands-on physical experiences is because it too lends itself well to the experience when we write, when we journal, when we respond to prompts, when we get like you guys just, you know, judge and rewarded those amazing students for their science fair projects. That, those physical activities, that content that they did that was not technically online is going to make them richer learners and it's gonna bring, it's gonna bring a lot of rich content to their writing all of a sudden when they're talking to their peers or they're writing in some, I don't mean to say a professional journal, but if they're responding to something, now they have this rich feedback. They can go back to an experience they had and bring it into their content. So I think that's what summer provides so many opportunities to go to museums, to continue to, you know, pick, pick at your passion, do things that you're, make you really, you know, get up out of bed and really excited. And, and I think that's what we just, we can help students. Um, return to the educational environment with a lot more excitement, a lot more content. And Dr. Ray, uh, I know you wanted to say something, but I saw a comment um, from Naded, Nadeji in the, in the comment section uh, to summarize what she said. She said, enjoy the journey and don't keep, and don't give up. 
I thought that part, enjoy the journey, enjoy what you're doing, um, because teaching can be cumbersome, it can be problematic, it can be challenging, but enjoy what you're doing. Enjoy that school is, is out for some of you or finishing up and enjoy the summertime. And then when school starts, continue to enjoy what you're doing. Great. So somebody else have a question, raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll try to address your question. Oh, wow. Nobody has a question. That's uh... You can post it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Um, I know one question was uh, a little bit earlier is about student motivation. And I think Dr. I think Danny, did, Mr. Danny did a great job talking about motivation and relationships. Um, and I don't know if we need to go a little bit more into that because it is it is hard to motivate students. Uh, and the best way that we can is by first starting off by uh, having that relationship with with the students and, and starting by um, welcoming them at the classroom door. Any yes, other? And, and we've talked about it there. You know, you as the teacher need to be friendly, but you don't need to be their friends. They have friends. And sometimes teachers can cross over the line and become too much friends with their students. So you know, watch that caution. Anybody else have a question? Uh, here is uh, Asma, I believe, Asma Mohammed. Go ahead, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, before she unmutes herself, uh, there has been an individual in the chat that's been sending some very derogatory comments. Um, they have been removed. And if anyone else is, is facing any of those uh, negative comments, please let us know. Um, they should not be involved in, in something uh, we're trying to do something good in helping people. So Asma, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself and we're excited to hear your question. Okay, hello. Hello, yeah, we can hear you. you. Yeah, we can hear you. What's your question? Oh, thanks for such a highly beneficial lecture. Oh, well, my you. question is, which is more beneficial? We're building upon, okay, what has been taught before, during the term, during the year, or, you know, working on the points of weaknesses that the student, okay, is suffering from during that year, which is more beneficial? Uh, uh, can I, would you just repeat the question, uh, which is more beneficial working on the points that were deficient in the year? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand. Okay, in other words, in other words, what I mean is, which is more beneficial for me as a teacher and for the student? Okay, building upon what has been taught before or just, okay, um, covering the point of weaknesses that the student has suffered from during the year. Okay, building on the things that have been taught or covering the weaknesses, is that what I understand? Yeah, right. If the student is suffering from, okay, some point of weaknesses during the, the year, okay. like grammatical mistakes, okay, spelling mistakes, okay, some errors in writing, okay, in the summer vacation, as a teacher, should I, okay, help, you know, correcting these mistakes or tackling them or just ignoring them and building upon what has been taught before during the year, which is more <laughs> important. And without being smart, my answer is yes to both. And I, I don't mean to, I don't mean to downplay your question. Those are both, and, and we can do that. We're not going to single out students and say you specifically, you specifically, but giving some general guidelines on some things that they can all work on this coming year. And I'm going to be uh, reading a story here just a little bit about that. So uh, I, I don't know, Dr. Jake, Danny, uh, do you have better? Uh, I, I would say, yes, they're both important is my short answer. Um, my thought would be, and just my, my, my thoughtful reaction to that would be, we don't wanna do a lot of like grammar support or things in isolation when a student's heading into the summertime. If there can be some drills that might be affected, but a lot of that is, it's in context of the writing that you're doing in the classroom. So it, it, it's most effective when they're with you in the classroom and you're having uh, an interaction with them in real time in the classroom. Uh, because in isolation at home, it probably won't have the staying power and they won't probably be able to coach themselves through it authentically, if that makes sense. Okay, I hope there's somewhat of a, 
of an answer to your question. And I think we both have kind of waffled a little bit on this because you know, they're both so important. It's the manner in which you do it that I think is important. Is there another question? Okay, well, uh, I wanna thank you all for the excellent participation today and the excellent comments uh, that you've made. I'd like to end this workshop by reading a uh, short story to you. If you'll bear with me, it takes about two minutes, but hopefully it's gonna put everything we've talked about in perspective. So here it goes. An old man meets a young man and the young man asks, do you remember me? And the old man says, no. Then the young man tells him that he was his student. And the teacher asks, what did you do? What do you do in life now? And the young man answers, well, I became a teacher. Oh, how good like me, asked the old man. And the young man said, well, yes. In fact, I became a teacher because you inspired me to be like you. And the old man, curious, asked the young man at what time he decided to become a teacher. And the young man tells him the following story. One day, a friend of mine, also a student, came into class with a brand new watch and I decided I wanted it. I stole it from him. I took it out of his pocket and shortly after that, my friend noticed that his watch was missing and immediately complained to the teacher, and that was you. Then you, the teacher, addressed the class saying, this student's watch was stolen during class today. Whoever stole it, please return it. I didn't give it back because I didn't want to. And then you, the teacher, closed the door and told us all to stand up in a circle. However, you told us all to close our eyes because you would only look for this watch if we all closed our eyes. So we all closed our eyes as you told us to do it. You went around this circle of students and from student to student, you went pocket to pocket. You reached in the pockets and when you went through my pocket, you found the watch and took it. You kept searching everyone's pockets, even though you already had the watch. And when you were done, you said, open your eyes, we have the watch. You didn't tell on me, and you never mentioned this to anybody. You never who said who stole the watch either. That day, you saved my dignity forever. It was the most shameful day of my life. But this is also the day I decided not to become a thief, a bad person. You never said anything, nor did you even scold me or take me aside to give me a moral lesson. I received your message clearly. Thanks to you, I understood what a real educator needs to do. Do you remember this episode, professor? And the old professor answered, yes. I remember the situation with the stolen watch, which I was looking for in everyone's pocket. I didn't remember you because I also had my eyes closed when I was looking. Now, this is the essence of teaching. If you, to correct, you must humiliate. You don't know how to teach. I hope you remember that story. It really moves me to talk about the effect of a teacher. So thank you all. We want for you a wonderful, wonderful summer. <laughs> we will be giving announcements for our fall workshop when they will start in August. So thank you all. Thanks to Dr. Jake and Mr. Danny for all of us working today. And we appreciate your wonderful comments and have a great summer and an end of the school year. Thanks so much. <laughs>